The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I am Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined this week by three fantastic co-hosts. Nate Arninger. Laura Nash. And I'm Shane Kelly. And uh, this week, this is another one of our topic-oriented episodes. We're not, we're not bringing you a discussion of a particular game this week. Instead, we're just chatting. And uh, Nate was the one who suggested the topic for this week, so I'll let him talk about it. Take it away, Nate. What a what a wonderful handoff! Thank you, Reagan. Yeah, so the, the idea. <laughs> I'm doing my best here. <laughs> uh, so the general idea here is that we play a lot of games. We're playing a new game every single week, or almost every single week. And when we cover them, we try to talk about everything within that game: art, direction, sound, gameplay. We spend a lot of time on narrative and story. And so I was thinking, you know, when I look back at the the like all the games that we played, I try to think like what has really stuck with me. And a lot of times it's one of two things. It's either the story or the actual gameplay mechanics. And so I thought it might be fun if we kind of go back in time here and we sort of round table discussion. What are some of our favorite gameplay or gameplay mechanics from the games that we've covered over the last whatever nine years that we've been doing this so this <laughs> whole long. yeah so you know i think we may end up like drifting into narrative because sometimes gameplay you know is uh because some people a... just saw the word mechanics and wrote narrative mechanics down and didn't read the word gameplay mechanics well so it's okay me. i mean i think that's the the mechanics of the game right yes like it, whatever stood out to you what do you mm-hmm. What is stuck with you? What do you think has been really fun or inventive or interesting mechanics from the games that we've played? And so we're just going to kind of go in a uh, a circle here, sharing these, uh, see what comes up, and then go from there. Yeah. I Who, does anybody... start. Yeah, Reagan. Do it. Go yes. ahead, okay. Um, I mean, this is a really easy one, and uh, when I think about game mechanics like just games that i enjoyed on a mechanical level and i'm thinking back over all the games we've talked about on the show um i the first game that jumped out into my mind was uh was hollow knight which is a game that i absolutely adored uh i i could not get enough of that game it came out in 2017 on pc i think 2018 on other devices um and uh while it wasn't the first game to employ a set of mechanics like the one that I wanted to to bring up. It was the first one that I really played a lot of that did this. Um, Hollow Knight had this mechanic that it called charms, where as you played through the game, uh, you would collect these different little badges that the Hollow Knight character could presumably wear. It wasn't like visible on his little outfit or whatever, which would have been very cute, but it was not. Um, You'd collect these charms and each of the charms had different sort of power up perks involved. But unlike a lot of games that have done that, the you know perk type system, the the charms system was pretty unique. Um, I mean, like I said, I know this has been done before. This is the place where I first seriously engaged with this type of system, um, and it's you know, just I, I, I still think about it. I see it all the time. I see it imitated all the time. Um, to kind of explain that mechanic, if you didn't play Hollow Knight, um, you know, you you collect these badges or these charms, and then in the menus there was a place where you could equip a certain number of charms. So you had to unlock s- slots to slot these charms into, uh, and the um, you know uh, upgrading your number of slots to put a charm into was like a major, incredibly impactful upgrade uh, in the game. And the charms would have a variety of different upgrade mechanics attached to them. So um, For example, like, you know, Dash Master was one of the charms and it meant that you could all the charms had, you know, little evocative bits of text and they had a little little graphic, but they were, you know, most of them had a pretty simple mechanic attached to them. Like with Dash Master, you could dash more or faster. I forget exactly how that worked or um, 
like there was uh, there was a very important one that I had equipped a whole lot that was called steady body that just meant that when you were attacking, you didn't get knocked back at all. There was always a little bit of knockback every time you did an attack in Hollow Knight. Um, and it would just deactivate that tiny little little like two pixel knockback every time you swung your, your nail. Um, and as you collected these, you'd try different combinations of them and they would have interesting interactions. And there were a lot of these. Sometimes they were like clearly designed interactions and sometimes they just sort of felt like like emergent interactions between the um, the, uh, the the charms and the mechanics that they would activate. Um, with the with the steady body thing, for example, like I used that in combination with quick slash, which is another you know very obvious sounding one, um, just meant you could attack faster. I used that constantly because then you could stand next to an enemy and really hammer on the attack button and you wouldn't move as you were doing it. And so you could get in tons of, if you were hitting that button fast enough, you could get in tons of attacks in spaces where without that set of charms in combination, you could maybe only get one or two slashes. Um, but there were tons of these. There's something like 40 different charms in the game with all kinds of different goofball um uh, you know, mechanics attached to them. Some of them are like the stuff you expect and others are like you smell really bad and release a cloud around you or you you constantly spawn little mosquito-like bugs that buzz around you and go and attack things near you. Like all sorts of weird mechanics attached to them too. And again, sometimes you would put on two different random charms and they would interact in a weird way where maybe those weird little bugs would have different behavior or do double damage or something like that based on the uh, the different combinations of charms. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to mention about the charms thing that I remember really being excited to discover um, w was that you could over charm yourself. It had this really clever mechanic where I may be remembering this wrong. I don't think it ever says this in the text anywhere in the game, but you would have, let's say you had four charm slots active and you put on one charm that had that took up three slots. You only had one socket or whatever these were called left. You could squeeze a different charm into that slot that took up more space than you had. So let's say I've got that only one dot or one you know socket left, but I have a charm I really want to equip that takes two or even three slots if you put it on the slot you wanted to put it into and you hammered the button to equip it a whole bunch of times it would put it in anyway but you were at a disadvantage in that you would take double damage uh when you were when you were in combat so it was this high risk high reward trade-off with this mechanic that i absolutely loved and i love that it, as far as i remember it never just tells you that you just sort of discover it by like hammering a button in the menu and suddenly like oh crap i can just squeeze an extra charm in there it was amazing so uh, reagan i've nearly 100 percented this game and i don't think that i knew that i this is all sounds very new to me <laughs> oh man that was That's incredible, incredible. But it, it's like you get this like over charmed state or something like that and i i'm pretty sure i discovered that by accident i i, I would not 100 percent swear to it because i played this game back in like 2017 2018 it's been years um but i'm pretty sure i discovered that by accident and uh I would use that going into boss fights because like once you learn a boss's pattern, um, having that extra charm made so much more difference than the extra hits because, you know, in that game, like it was all about learning a boss's patterns. Once you learn the boss's patterns, you know, a lot of this stuff was going to one hit kill you anyway. And so, you know, Oh, with the difference between like, I don't know, a one hit and a two hit kill wasn't that important, but the difference between being able to equip like two or three or four charms, like an extra, a whole extra charm, massive. So yeah, I loved the entire way this, this mechanic was implemented in this game. I think about it all the time. There are games that have imitated it and I always look for it. I'm always excited to see it. Um, I, I often like it, although it, I've never seen it done as well as, as what Hollow Knight did with it. So um, yeah, that's, that's charms. Did you guys, do you guys remember the charms mechanic in hollow Knight? Did you guys engage with that system very much? Yeah, I loved it. It was a lot of fun. I, I remember some of the weirder ones, most especially like, um, one that would switch out. Um, I forget you had like a up smash energy burst ability and it would switch it out for 
uh, spawning a bunch of weird fluke enemies that were That's like the a one bunch I was of thinking of. Yeah, like the weird leeches. mosquitoes or yeah. what? Oh no, wait, maybe maybe those are two different bugs you could spawn. I there, yeah, there were several that involved like spawning bugs, uh, but I think there was one that did little little flying guys. The the flukes were the ones that like ran on the ground and had the oh, weird yeah ring shaped mouths. Gross, gross, super gross. Uh, but yeah, the, the combinations were what was really fun. And a lot of the charms, honestly, though, a lot of the charms were kind of um, like minor changes, like improvements to your speed or your damage or your sprint or like changing some of your moves a little bit. But then some of them were just fundamental changes to how the game plays, like um, uh, chain. one of them was that you would get from, um, I think from the like the bees would turn your health mask bar thing into a bunch of little honeycombs that would um, like recharge in a very different way. Uh, There was a bunch of little things like that. I really enjoyed Tunic's variation on this, which is you can basically get charms, but you they're inexplicable and you have no idea. You have to figure out what they do, um, which was a fun way to build on that. Like I I think, um, that was a different risk reward system, but like, <laughs> man, um, it, it was always like, wow, if I put this on this, it felt more like getting a magical object in D and D or something like, cool. If I put this necklace on I might be cursed or it might be great. Who knows? Let's find out. Mm-hmm. So I, I think people have done really cool stuff since then with the charm system. But when I hear people talk about it, they almost always are citing hollow Knight first. That's a, yeah, I'd forgotten about, um, Tunic definitely kind of did this and did it pretty well. It was a smaller number of options in Tunic, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like, and I think it had a little less in terms of interactions, although it certainly were some surprises with that, but yeah, like with everything in Tunic, it was like, well, I'll turn this on. What does it do? No idea. Yeah. For those who haven't played Tunic is a game where the manual is missing and everything is in a glyph language you can't read. So like, you don't know what anything does. Um, which makes charms a uh, real gamble. It's like playing a, a, a an NES game where the manual is in pieces and also in Russian or something. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was great. <laughs> makes me think of uh, another one of my favorite mechanics. I think is similar uh, from one of my favorite games, uh, the relic system from Slay the Spire, which mm-hmm. again is taking... You know, in this case, you're not equipping and unequipping, but you are acquiring pieces that sometimes add minor adjustments to the way your run is going to go, the way you play the game, and at other times are significantly impacting the way the deck works and the way the gameplay works. And so finding that right balance, making good selections, all just stacking up these little adjustments that ultimately result in a pretty significant change uh, is really, really satisfying. I think we've seen, uh, yeah, the charm thing end up in a bunch of different games. The relic thing at this point is a standard almost in most uh, roguelikes or or deck builders. Uh, So really, really fun mechanics. Who wants to go next? Oh, I've definitely got something I want to I want to talk about. Um, And it's right out of one of my favorite games of all time, Magic the Gathering. Mm. of course um, so uh yeah nate when we were discussing this as a plan you did not say from games we have played uh you just That's said fair. favorite mechanics so mm-hmm. uh here we go i feel like even if i did make it clear that we were doing games that we've covered we've you would say on the show. It's you would game. say well we've talked about magic the gathering right. enough on this show that we've essentially covered it so uh we'll give this you a is... pass here either way one of the best things about magic is that it's always changing. You know, if you're a fan, there's always something new and they are even after 30 plus years innovating all the time on kind of new ways for the game to work. And, um, uh, a while back, I want to say it's probably it's been a few years now since they, since they, they started this, they wanted to come up with a way, uh, to represent stories in the game. Right. The game produces a lot of stories, you know, you and the the characters from those stories have their own cards and the locations from those stories have their own cards and the, uh, you know, the spells cast by the wizards in there have their own cards. But the stories themselves weren't really represented um, on cards and they were getting ready to do a set 
uh, right around the time I started playing again um, that was called Dominaria. And it reintroduced kind of Magic's home world, its home plane of existence. And um, it's a place that has a lot of history. And so they were really digging into this idea of how do we show um, a story that kind of unfolds in in multiple parts, right? Uh, and there have been lots of little ways they've represented that kind of thing in the past, you know, things that represent, uh, you know, story moments have been on the cards from the very beginning. But they came up with a new card type called a saga. And sagas are really one of my favorite things that they've come up with in the game in a, in a very long time. So the idea with a saga is it's an enchantment, which means it's a card that you play out and it kind of stays on the battlefield and you can't like attack it like a like a like a player or attack with it like a creature. It just kind of hangs out there. And uh, enchantments historically have always just kind of done something while they're in play. Um, sagas, they came up with a completely new card design where instead of having name at the top, then a picture, and then the card text, they divided the card left and right, right? And on the left side, they have a series of chapters that'll have like number one, two, three. I think the greatest number of them on any of them uh, was one printed recently that had like six, but usually like three or four chapters. And each turn, uh, one of those things will take place. Um, I've got an example of one of my favorite ones called The Eldest Reborn. And this is a card that represents uh, kind of the rebirth of one of Magic's uh, biggest bad guys. Uh, and th it has sort of three steps to it. The first is, you know, each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. Second step is each opponent discards a card. And then the third step is put a creature or planeswalker from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So these things all mm. kind of work together. It does on, uh, this is a spell that costs a bit of mana. It's like five mana. So um, there's definitely going to be some things in the graveyard. It uh, kills the opponent's stuff and then lets you have a chance to kind of bring it back. And that's there's a story relevance to it. And the thing artistically that they've done with these that is really neat is they... Uh, they do the because they divided the card kind of left and right. The right side has this full height piece of art uh, across the whole card. And these have re been represented by pieces of art that would exist in the game world, like to tell these stories. So there will be things like paintings, um, uh, pages from a book. Um, there are like relief carvings. Um, there's even one that's like a... Um, uh, a, a tapestry, right? And um, the 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 way that they're able to take the kind of story elements in the game and turn them into these cards has continuously been a real delight to me. Um, so I'll give one last example, uh, and that's one called Urza's Saga. And to put this into context for the non-magic people, um, Urza's saga was a set of cards uh, about this character Urza, who's like a big, powerful wizard in the history of magic. And you don't um, say. so, yeah, mm -hmm. no kidding, right? Uh, but he's probably the most famous, most powerful one. And um, when I was a kid, Urza's name was on all the cards. Uh, you know, you were like, who is this? You see this name everywhere. And you're like, who is this Urza, Urza guy? I've got his card that's up. It says Urza's power plant and Urza's tower and all of that. Um, and uh, over the way they've evolved, how they tell the stories, um, the um, the things like these sagas are able to kind of really represent it. And, and so you get things like this Urza's saga card that is a direct callback to that set probably 20 years ago um, that kind of retells the story there, shows um, an illustration from what looks like a sketchbook of Urza kind of showing a spell or something like that. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I guess the thing that I really like about this mechanic is how much it, how simple it is and how well it conveys exactly what it's meant to, which is, um, uh, being a little representation of a story in the game. Um, so, you know, I, thanks for letting me get more magic content uh, out <laughs> to you guys. There you go. I love when a card game manages to sort of 
break that uh the you know card games are are so mechanical right and and it's really really challenging to make it anything other than like well mine's a four or five and yours is a three two and i win and you know it's just points on we're stacking points and we're building our stack so the way it's cool that they're able to bring some semblance of like a, of storytelling into it uh i still am playing uh, a bunch of marvel snap which i don't really talk about on the show because i'm almost embarrassed by the amount of marvel snap that i still play <laughs> uh, but they do something sort of similar where the abilities it's really fun how they make the abilities representative of the marvel character that they're playing that that it is representing you know like uh the cyclops card uh can you know depending on if you depending on the circumstances will shoot lasers from its eyes and reduce the power of the cards that you're playing against and things like that spider-man's moving all over the board like they're they're really trying to make the cards feel like the characters mm -hmm. uh and i think that's uh a real challenge for a card game and even minor success in it. I, I absolutely love when that happens. It, it, that's to yeah. me, that's the kind of resonant design where you have um, something simple. You know, it has to fit on a card uh, in a, just a couple of lines of rules text, and it has to embody some notable character, something important mm -hmm. from a story. Um, there are so many great examples of that. Um, you know, I, I think when I was a kid, uh the i had a card that was like a vampire and it had the ability lifelink on there and you read okay it means that when it deals damage you gain that much life right perfect harmony of the rules yeah. text with exactly what it's meant to represent and i love it yeah absolutely well i'll hop in because i have another narrative mechanic and it's not uh, necessary about lore, but it can be. And I, I'm picking like when the game tempts you into making a bad decision because it tells you there's a better story behind that mm. terrible door. And it's like, <laughs> this is going to be so bad for you. Don't you want to do it? Like every I time the game that. does this, it's the yeah. best. Uh -huh. like, I, I love two choices and both are bad. Both are interesting. But like specifically when the odds are weighted and you like, you know, there's the thing that will make the path easy and boring and then they're like but don't you want to make your life just this much worse to see what's behind door number two gamers don't you love fucking up don't you love it when you suck <laughs> uh. <laughs> i'm not talking about like a lot of dating sims have like one clearly right answer and two ones that are duds and like there's nothing exciting behind the dud doors. The person just is like, eh, and you move on. I'm talking about like the stuff that um, Fall in London has a storyline where you can basically tank your character. I've never done it because I'm a coward, but everyone like, <laughs> but it's, it's like always tempting. But like, I love that it's there. Someday I'm going to do it and destroy my character. But um, I'm actually going to talk about a moment in a Dungeons and Dragons game uh, where the role playing decision that was just a terrible decision and made everybody's like almost keep they like, almost killed the entire party. Um, but the story was so good that everyone was like, yeah, that was good gameplay. And that is, I might've told the story before. Uh, so long time listeners, excuse me, but we were playing in Seattle um, and we were in a room with, it was lined with cabinets. And after every round, the cabinets would open and a fresh round of skeletons would enter. So you get through the play order and like the magic cabinets open and like eight skeletons come in. So every round, eight new skeletons and we're not killing them eight per round. We are, we are drowning in piles of skeletons and there's a book shining on a altar or well, we found out later it was an altar. It was just on a little dais. So we sent the one person in the group who could read the best, our sorcerer forward. We're like, Rob, Go read the spell on the dais. You're our sorcerer. Rob runs up. We guard him. We are fighting these skeletons. Rob reads the book and goes, oh, it's a prayer. Sorry, my character turned his back on <laughs> all gods. Refused to read it. We are nice. literally like peeping out from the cords of skeletons going, Rob, <laughs> what are you doing? We're going to all die. <laughs> and he was just book. like, no. 
Yikes. <laughs> you Yikes. get inspiration. <laughs> yeah. And we were like, well, you get inspiration. Not a lot and of good I guess... that's going to do against 80 skeletons. Right. Yeah. So like someone like <laughs> someone who was practically like, you know, very unintelligent had to go up and stumble through and did the spell horribly and, you know, but like such a better story. And it's because we had um, when games are at their best, when like like Night in the Woods does this. I don't want to spoil it because it's a narrative thing. So I feel like there's more spoiler. But there's a moment where you you have the chance to be the dirtbag you always have been or be better. And the game is like, oh, man, you're going to be a dirtbag. <laughs> 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 like that's who you are. And you want the game weighs the odds so heavily in being the character you've established. That's when the game. I, I'm told Disco yeah. Elysium is like the the champion of this. I still haven't mm-hmm. played it, but Laura, like, I I, that, I was I was getting ready to like, just tell me in. about all the things and, in Disco Elysium. I'm gonna love. <laughs> well, I, I it really uh, the moment you started talking about this, I was like, well, yeah. this is exactly what D- Disco Elysium does so well. I mean, it, it does a million things like perfectly, and one of them is this: is you can basically play as a fascist. And the game doesn't really pass any judgment on on that. Mm-hmm. But you as a, you know, hopefully moral person playing it like the, the fascist decisions are often the most chaotic, horrible decisions that you could make. But they're there. And, you know, I've heard that it's a really I, I didn't I've only played through the game one time. I've been considering playing it again here shortly because I loved it so much. And there's mm-hmm. so many different ways you can play it. And the the fascist path is apparently like also deeply interesting uh but also you're a horrible human the entire game like end to end and it's not how i normally play games but it is certainly compelling especially in in that game yeah you don't have to be a bad person but like there are times when like I, i just really enjoy a game that is crafted so that you know yourself well enough to know like oh yeah the maximum path is wrong for me. I'm going to do this. It is going to be yeah. bad. Like that's when I really, I know a game's got me and it takes a lot of work before that moment to make that moment work. Every time it's so memorable and it's, I'm talking in abstract because I don't, those are some of my favorite moments in games and I don't want to spoil them. But like when we're all thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I know that happens and it's so good. And if you put that in any narrative game, like, and you've, you've got my investment i'm gonna love your game this has been happening for me in Baldur's gate three um yeah i'm uh, i'm still in kind of the part one uh there and i'll try not to spoil anything because it's very early and i don't uh you know but it's it's significant anyway i've managed to get to a kind of a goblin camp area and um there's a goblin healer there that you've been hearing lots of rumors about a uh, big plot element of this game is that you're trying to find a healer who can take an alien parasite out of your head. So um, from the moment you meet her, it's very much telegraphed that this goblin healer, although interesting and, and probably has a lot going on for, for the story, is not really going to be the brain surgeon that you sought <laughs> out. <laughs> and uh, I I thought about it, and the, the character... Uh, that I made is uh, Esky the Wizard, uh, who's a down on his out, da- down and out. <laughs> I remember um, Esky <laughs> Wizard. Yeah, you remember him from our D and D campaign. I brought him back for this, and yeah, um, yeah. he's 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 the uh, the 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 wizard who is a rogue at heart. And um, he was like, you know what? I've got a few options, but hell, if this if this goblin thing works out, I can, I can ditch everyone and uh, mm-hmm. go back to, and so we gave it a shot and you know what? It, it didn't work big surprise, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but the result was actually fantastic. Um, and uh, allowed me to essentially, uh, skip what I think would have been a, uh, a, a pretty, um, annoying boss fight among other things. <laughs> so interesting. Uh, and introduces some new, a new character that I hadn't, met before that now I'm very intrigued by. So they, they really give uh, when you give. I think it's it's kind of the give and take between the game designer and you. The game designer is like, well, really, you can be that stand-up hero that you kind of, that many players probably want to be, but you can also be 
a weirdo or a fuck up. And we have written gray. stories for yeah. those people, especially. And we're very happy to 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 have you as our customer. Yeah. It it's that like, makes... oh, I'm gonna go for the chaos gate every time in Hades yes. option. Like you can kind of <laughs> there or... may be no good option behind that door, but like, don't you want to see? I love it. Yeah, or another game that we covered that I think a lot about um is Pyre. And mm-hmm. you know, when yeah. you when you successfully win wizard basketball, you have to you, you know, you're free members of your party to go into uh, I don't remember the full story, but like back to the real world or, top whatever. Side or whatever. Yeah, top yeah. side. And um, you're faced with this complicated choice of like, well, they all have their merits and they all have their purpose and they all have their desires for returning back to the main world. But also that one's like my best dunker, you know, and I need mm-hmm. them to win these basketball games. But also I care about their story the most. And you just end up in these really complicated decisions where you're trying to balance just the actual gameplay and who you want to keep around and how you want to win games. And also whose story you're most invested in or who you think like deserves to go topside the most. It's it's a really interesting and uh and and fun balance that yeah they don't they don't the game doesn't really like the the designers have made it where every path is going to be fun or interesting it's just how you want to handle it well i'll go now um completely opposite of yours i'm going to talk about a gun thing um (laughs) so my favorite It is probably like a super obvious pick, but I when I was thinking about this episode and like what gameplay mechanics have stuck with me, there's one that is just like at the top without a question, and it is the entire concept of the game Super Hot. Uh, I've talked about it a ton on this show, but I'll never miss a chance to talk about it. The game's getting old at this point, so there may be people who have never played this game that are listening to this show now. And the entire concept is that time doesn't move or rather, it moves incredibly slowly uh, if you as a player are not moving. And the thing that I like so much about it is that I think at its core, so many uh, like first-person shooters are trying to make you feel like the action hero stuff that we see in every action hero movie, you know, like somehow never getting shot, uh, taking out mass hordes of enemies with a single clip, you know, pulling off these crazy stunts. And most games, it doesn't really accomplish that. Like, it feels something like that, but it also has this, you know, you, you're being shot like 20 times and it just doesn't feel very uh, like like what it would be like in the movies. And this game, because of that simple mechanic, time doesn't move if you're not moving, allows you to... Uh, pull off like really fun and challenging combat situations where you're like the one that always sticks out to me is that you start in an elevator with like three guys pointing guns at you and you don't have anything and you have to perfectly uh, dodge and duck and and get around all of the bullets as they're coming at you karate chop the guys take the guns take them out and then the elevator doors open and there's like five guys there pointing at you too and it's all possible and it's a ton of fun uh i know the game has their whole thing uh it's the most innovative shooter in years or whatever but like that still kind of rings true to me i have not played i'm not a huge like first person shooter game guy but i would say probably like more so than I don't know how much you all are playing them, but I, di- you know, I'll dip my toes in in a lot of these to try to find one that I like, and and no game has come close to feeling as fun and interesting as Super Hot. So one of my favorite gameplay mechanics. I, uh, if you've not played the game, highly recommend it. And it translated to uh, VR better than like anything else that I've played too. It's been a little while since I've been in the VR world. I don't know, Shane, you you've dug into it more but still for my money that was the best VR experience it's something i think of when i'm playing breath of wild or tears the kingdom and i shoot my arrow in time stops i'm like Mm -hmm. super hot was great (laughs) 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 yeah yes yeah it's hard to beat so it's like it's just I, i am surprised it doesn't get imitated more uh, right. and, and where I have seen it, it is like, sometimes folks slot that in as like a mechanic 
in a larger experience. Like there's like mm-hmm. the super hot power up essentially in other games sometimes. But man, it's it's hard to be super hot. It's just such a cool idea and executed so well. I love that game. Um, and I, I still haven't gotten to really spend time. I, I did play some of the VR version, um, but it was on PSVR. And I don't know, I, I, I didn't stick with it. I didn't ever beat that. Hmm. I'd I'll like bring to go my back um, the... I'll bring my headset over and uh, you could try it out. Yeah, you know, I'd like to sometime. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, I know you're the 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 you know you have the whatever the the the. Ugh. Sorry, I, I have, have the, the Meta Quest. Brain. That's it. Two. You have the Meta Quest uh, two, and uh, that always seemed a lot better. I, I, my um, PSVR is sitting packed up in a closet, and I haven't touched it in probably three years, maybe more. So. Um, I I haven't played a lot of VR lately, but I'd be interested to to give that another shot sometime. Um, I have one more um, that I was going to bring up. I was thinking just like, okay, over the course of the show, like what are the games that like I keep thinking about year after year, trying to think of like, well, what mechanics would I bring up? And um, what I ended up coming back to was a game that I still think more people should play. I think everyone should play it. The Wizard Sniffer. Uh, which hmm. won IF Comp in 2017. Weirdly, both of the things I ended up picking today were 2017 games. I don't know why that happened. I guess that was a good year. But um, the Wizard Sniffer had a lot to recommend it. Um, if for folks who don't remember it uh, or or weren't you know don't listen to our IF Comp coverage way back in 2017, it's been a long time. <laughs> um, the the Wizard Sniffer was a sort of limited parser game. The it's very funny. Um, the the premise is that you are playing as a pig. Uh, who is uh, recently bought by a knight who is going into an enchanted castle to rescue a fair maiden. Um, And there is an evil wizard who runs, or the knight certainly believes there's an evil wizard that needs to be uh, found. And so he has purchased a wizard sniffing pig to help him find the wizard. And you are that pig. You, as the pig, don't really believe that you can sniff out wizards nor do you believe that your um uh that that such a thing is even really possible uh the knight is is uh just absolutely an idiot but you are following him around and uh, it has some great mechanics the the main sort of interesting thing about it from a parser game perspective is that you know you really only have one interaction in the game which is sniff you can sniff things and the various different characters that are traveling with you the knight his squire and a few other characters that you'll encounter things like a dragon um, will respond to you sniffing things in different ways and so a lot of the puzzles uh, relate to you know who is near you managing you know who's around bringing people from room to room and sniffing objects in front of them to get them to take different actions you might sniff a doorknob and the knight might hit it with his sword and break it but the squire might actually open the door for you that kind of thing that however is not the mechanic I wanted to talk about sniffing things. Great mechanic, but this game had another. I love that. I thought oh, the sniffing thing mechanic. Incredible. Also in Toby's nose. Great. Yes. Also great. And just limited parser stuff in general. My computer's odor card is not good enough for most games. <laughs> sniffing mechanics. So what is the mechanic? Use your mind's nose, Shane. Um, mm. the, the mechanic that I did want to bring up here was specifically, and this is something I don't think I've ever seen really replicated or, 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 or like, um, copied, um, is the hint system in this game was one of the cleverest things I've ever seen. Um, and I, again, I, this does sort of straddle the line between a mechanic and, and narrative, but very early in this game, as the pig, you sniff into a trash can full of puzzles. That's a thing that happens in this. And in the trash can full of puzzles, there are a couple of talking fleas that jump out and take up residence behind your ears. One flea behind each ear. And the fleas explain to you that they know a lot about puzzles. And if you need help with a puzzle, you can oink. That's the only other thing you can type other than sniff, basically, other than, and, you know, go north or whatever. Um, you can oink, and uh, the fleas will both give you a hint. But one of them always lies, and one of them always tells the truth, <laughs> and you're never sure which one is which. And the incredible thing about this is that it turns the hint system, which almost any really puzzle-focused game 
needs to at least think about having some kind of a hint system and hint systems are hard to do well you know we've we've all played things that have the like invisi clues style uh it's maybe a bit of a deep cut for folks who aren't in the uh, interactive fiction scene but invisi clues style interact uh, um like interactive hint systems are things where there's like progressive disclosures where you know you ask for a hint and it gives you a vague one you ask for another hint and it gives you a slightly less vague one and again and again until it finally just tells you what's up right this doesn't have that uh, and it doesn't have, there's lots of other approaches to hints that are, you know, that are great, good stuff. But this one in particular, every time you ask for a hint, the hint is in its in and of itself another little puzzle, trying to puzzle out which of the two things that you've just been told is true. Um, if I had been a better uh, host here, I would have gone back and played through this game again and maybe copy and pasted some examples of this. So you'll kind of just have to, I did not. Uh, so you'll kind of just have to take my word for it. But the Wizard Sniffer is worth playing for a hundred different reasons. It is free. You can just, you know, if you search for the Wizard Sniffer, it'll come up. You can play it in your browser. Um, and it's also pretty short for one of these. And because it has such a limited set of verbs that you can type in, I think it makes an excellent first uh, interactive fiction game for folks who aren't uh, super into text-based, you know, interactive fiction or, or uh, text adventure games. Uh, but it also is an all-timer. Um, there have been uh, a lot of different, you know, obviously it, it won uh, the, um, uh, it won like the best in show or whatever for the, for the IF comp that year. I think it also won best game in the Zizzy Awards that year. Uh, and it's won a ton of other awards. And um, in the very infrequently updated uh, interactive fiction top 50 of all time that occasionally gets done on the uh, IFDB, um, which isn't super scientific, um, but I think it's good and representative. Um, it it was in like ninth place uh, in the 2019. They only do that every few years. So it's it's like an all-timer in my opinion and maybe my favorite interactive fiction game of all time. Um, and this specific thing about it is something that I have thought about since 2017. And I keep thinking like I would love for other games to figure out ways to do this thing. Obviously, maybe not with fleas, but something similar. Um, and I've never seen it done again. Uh, that I that I know of, maybe other folks have, um, but uh, that's 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 the other thing that I thought of when I was like, wow, well, what are the, my favorite little? Yeah. yeah, I would say it's second only to Lost Pig uh, in terms of pig based interactive fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Deep there world. are a surprising number of good uh, uh, porcine uh, interactive fiction. <laughs> if games. I had a nickel for every pig based game in the top fifty, I would have two nickels, which mm-hmm. isn't a lot, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. weird that it happened twice. I didn't actually uh, I didn't actually mention the the author's name Buster Hudson who's also done a number of other uh, great interactive fiction games he's a little less prolific than some of the other sort of folks who are in the comp every year a new Buster Hudson game is more of like an event um, but uh, actually if you look at his uh, list of previous games he had uh, another game that was not long before that maybe a year or two before called her majesty's trolley problem also prominently features a pig so it's a bit of a theme hmm. anyway i uh i can't recommend it enough um anybody else got one sure i keep thinking about a game we played a long time ago i need to re-download this one for um for maybe the steam deck i think i'd, I'd probably put another few zillion hours into it the game was loop hero Um, Hmm. i don't remember what year this one came out it's been a little while um but loop hero had a really unique um fantasy combat mechanic thing going on it's right there in the in the kind of main um you know it's there in the title uh you're on this loop Uh, the hero goes around in a circle and battles whatever is in front of him um over and over until you win or you die uh but the game plays kind of like a cross between Carcassonne and a deck builder, like a tile laying slash deck building slash whatever. Um, That is that particular, like building the world around you as you go as the main way of interacting with it. And your quote unquote character having essentially no controls. I really thought that was such a cool design, such a cool mechanic. Um, I I wish I had seen more games kind of inspired by Loop Hero. Yeah, it's like an auto runner, uh, mm-hmm. but you're you're crafting the world around your auto runner so that they can continue to run and be effective. Uh, Shane, I almost this this game is on my list of of like mechanics that I could talk mm-hmm. about because 
yeah, the the loop system in that was just so satisfying. Um, I I played su- a ton of that game. Mm-hmm. The surprises that you would get when you put certain cards adjacent to each other or, you know, piled up a bunch of one type of card in an area. Um, that's some of my favorite little surprises in a game because you're like, oh, well, of course, if I put a bunch of mountains together, you get a mountain range. And then it always would reward you with something nice um, whenever you'd figure something like that out. I really enjoyed Loop Hero, but I also found it so addictive that I was like, is this just... Do I love this or do I resent it for addicting me? So I think like, yeah, yeah. but that's like part of the joy of it. Like I'm surprised more people haven't taken it because it's like, but it's not like serving me ads. Like it's just like I need to do another round. Like I need to another keep run. going. Yeah. One yeah, more I, go. One more go. <laughs> that game, like I, the mechanic itself is, is brilliant. I think the game mm-hmm. itself, like it was broken into three acts and I – tried so desperately to beat that game to finish the third act and i think i probably ended up putting like 25 or 30 hours into that game and it just was never able to finish it so i was like all right i it eventually got like deeply frustrating but i think that was more the the game itself the mechanic though the loop hero itself was incredible and i think a a a tighter uh like shorter game would have been better, but uh, that uh, like Shane, you're you're totally right. I loved the the loop process, and I'd love to see more of that. Just where you're crafting the world around something. Uh, I was thinking about tile placement in general as like a mechanic that I love because we've done Carto and um, Shane. What was that? Uh, Arrow uh, the the um, tower defense game that we we played. Uh, Isle also, of Arrows. Isle of Arrows. Oh yeah. yeah. That was also a, a really good tile placing game. Mm-hmm. And now for something completely different. I thought about <laughs> doing a puzzle mechanic or like talking about the like two little room stuff of unpacking or Florence. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was like, no, let's do a pure mechanic unattached to story. I'm going for the dedicated button that does nothing but like one nonsense thing. I'm talking mm. the honk button and untitled use name i'm talking the dance button and wonder song oh <laughs> like, yeah give me the a hug button. button in a boy in his blob yeah, yeah give me a button that's just for stress relief and joy and i am very happy um yeah, yeah. I've, i'm playing i've started tears of the kingdom and every button does eight things and none of them honk. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's absurd how many mechanics they crammed into uh a lot of buttons there's a lot of buttons on on switch and there's there's not enough buttons for tears of the kingdom everything constantly whistling for my horse uh, accidentally um but no i i love like if you can pare down your other mechanics to the point that you have a button just for nonsense and joy i think it's really really fun um because at times you're just kind of like sad bored You've got a kid near you, and you're like, "Come here, eh, like, honk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> look at the dance I can do." Like, I it sounds like a very silly mechanic because it doesn't forward the plot or whatever. But it's some of the like just moments of wonder in games. Is like, yeah, what does this button do? I liked uh, in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the the Shredder's uh, Shredder's Revenge or whatever the game that we played. Not, well, I don't know, sometime in the last three or four years, uh, there was like the taunt button or, or the, da- the, the dance taunt button. Yeah. You know, it's like if, if you if you're designing a game and you got a button, you got an extra button, there's something fun in there. Why not make them do a little dance? Taunt your enemies. Mm hmm. Yeah. Give me a nonsense button. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Nate, I think you probably have a, a meteor mechanic to discuss. Mm, to end I don't this. know. I mean, <laughs> similarly, a bit of nonsense. So uh, there's a lot that I, I could throw out here, but I think the one that'll land best with this group that I loved as a mechanic, but I think it did bounce off some people poorly. But for me, the uh, the ship flying in outer wilds is one yes. of the things that I yeah. have. Like I, when I think about that game, the choice to make the 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 flying of the spacecraft 
nearly uh, like Octodad or I am bred level of like stupid and difficult at times really stood out to me. And I think it adds a ton to the narrative side of the game, but it's also just I really enjoyed it. I loved the sort of chaos of flying around in this little dinky craft and crashing all the time and like spending a lot of time trying to get good at landing. You know, they they really, as the game goes on, they, you know, there's some things that can help you land, but you can also try to do it yourself. And just like the challenge of getting good at flying the ship and trying to land it was so fun. And a thing that I think this game totally did not need to do uh, that I absolutely loved. You know, I, I think the specific thing about that, that I love, like I, I do love everything about it's, it's flying mechanics and they are a huge impediment to people. I do know a lot of folks yeah. bounced off that game in the early hours cause they couldn't wrap their brain around it's, it's flight mechanics. And that's fair enough. Like it, it is not easy. Um, it, it is kind of fiddly. Uh, I, I think you do, you do get better at it, but what, uh, what I thought about playing that was like specifically the sort of inertia based thrust based flying. Like you mm-hmm. can go that all the way back to asteroids with that, you know, you thrust and you build up some velocity and then you're just going in that. I mean, it's, you know, that's sort of natural. That's, that's the nature of, of navigating in three dimensions in space. Right. But, um, that game does some nice things. Like it gives you a, a button that will automatically use thrusters to bring you to a, to a stop. But like I played so many games over the years where that is the mechanic, whether it's Moonlander or I played a lot of escape velocity when I was a kid, uh, various clones of asteroids, mm-hmm. um, any game that lets you like do sort of directional or thrust based uh, flying with inertia. I always love that. I, you know, yeah. in everything that I play and this, uh, the, um, outer wilds was one of the first that really made me grok that in actual three dimensions though. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. It made me think too. I had a, a one of my favorite all time gaming experiences was, uh, for whatever reason, I got really into Kerbal space program at the very beginning mm-hmm. when it was still in beta and it really oh. was just a, like a sandbox game and you're just trying to build and land on stuff. There were no objectives or anything. And so learning how to fly these ships in in their version of space, you know, it, it, it really felt like that in Outer Wilds as well. And uh, I, I, I really, really enjoyed it, even if it was very frustrating at times. And I don't blame anyone who bounced off this game because of it. But for me, it just really stood out as, as a highlight of a game that did not need to have that degree of, of like you know, physics around its flying that made it more challenging, made it goofier, made it like kind of funnier just is a really good addition to that game incredible mm-hmm. well looking at our show clock i think we're just about out of time um so listeners thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the short game uh if you have a favorite mechanic a very specific favorite mechanic either from a game we've talked about on the show or maybe just something from a short game you've played uh let us know in the discord that'd be a great place for us to do it uh you can pop in there and let us know what your fave mechanic is and we'll chat about it with you and if you aren't in our discord let me tell you how to get there Uh, you can find our show on the internet at shortgame.fm which is a page with all the info you need about the show and how to get to all of our different socials and everything Um, you can find uh, and also on there is a link to our patreon every one of our patrons gets access to our discord and uh, it's a great hangout on the internet Um, probably also the easiest way to send us uh, suggestions if you have particular suggestions for games you'd like to hear us talk about on the show Um, speaking of which next week our plan is to discuss dredge so unless something sucks us under you know a large tentacle emerges from the depths and drags the show to the to the bottom uh, we'll be talking about dredge next week something that folks have been asking us for uh, since that game came out and uh, i'm excited to talk about it let's see you can find me on the internet i'm mostly on mastodon these days uh at reagan r-a-y-g-a-n uh, at bird dot rodeo uh and uh let's see uh you can find our show on mastodon at the sh- uh, at short game at mastodon dot social uh or it is still uh on x i guess if you want to hit us up there at underscore short game uh and uh let's see uh shane where can people find you uh you can find me on twitter at 8bit shane and on mastodon at 
Shane at bird.rodeo. Or wait, no, am, am I 8 bit Shane there? Jam. I'm still getting <laughs> you're just Shane. I think I'm just Shane. Uh, this is the world we're all in right now. Is like, yeah. all right, which You'll one am I? You'll find me where you find me. Yeah. I'm about to I'm about to start listing my my blue sky and I, threads handles on here. I just made a blue real sky. complicated. Yeah, I just yeah, got blue. Um, <laughs> uh, Nate, where can people find you? I don't even post that much, so I don't know if it's. But if you want to find me on on these, it's Nate STL at Twitter, and then Nate STL at Bird Rodeo, which is fun on. Uh, mastodon and then i do have a blue sky but i've not really figured out anything on there yet so it's also nate stl same and laura where can people find you uh laura j nash at all the places specifically mastodon because you can't just say that laura j nash at bird.rodeo but um generally uh, except on instagram where that's someone else inexplicably um (laughs) who has my exact specific name (laughs) um (laughs) It's me. I'm parking it until I couldn't get uh, it. Until couldn't I get can, it, uh, so you know, no one will find game. me on Instagram, but that's fine. I'm gonna sell it to you. Uh, and Please listeners, do. once again, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Short Game.